Um, so, just to introduce um, the group of really um, exciting people we've got to discuss this whole issue of um, spreading smart ideas, really looking at innovation policy from a number of angles, particularly from the, the SME angle, and looking at the way that new technology might help. We've got um, Brad Krauskopf, who is CEO of Hub Australia, which is Australia's largest co-working community, which he founded in 2011. Um, he's recently been named Australia's Small Business Ambassador for 2013, and he's an ambassador for the Connected Village, and is part of the leadership group of the Shared Value Project. So, welcome to the ANU, Brad. Looking forward to um, talking with you. Um, Iala Flynn, at the end there, is... Um, how's the sound working? Is that... It's good? Okay. Um, he's Head of Public Policy and Government Affairs at Go for Google Australia and New Zealand. He joined Google in 2007 as European Public Policy Manager, based at the company's European HQ in Ireland. And prior to joining Google, um, he spent 12 years in senior roles in telecoms in, um, in Ireland. And to my right here, um, Jim Beninfi, who runs the Grattan Institute's Productivity Growth Program. Um, Jim was chief economist of the Boston Consulting Group for 13 years, um, and um, sorry, 13 years at Boston Consulting Group and seven years as chief economist for Australia and New Zealand. Um, and we're very grateful to be doing this with Grattan and Google. I think it's really exciting, and we're addressing some really um, interesting issues. So what we decided to do is we want to make this as interactive as possible. So I don't want to go full flow with the panel and then open up for questions. I'd like members of the audience, you have to wait for the microphone, but signal if you've got a constructive contribution to make as we're going along, a question for some, one of us, or actually make a substantive point, then signal, and we'll make that as interactive as possible. I've been passed an iPad with a Twitter thing, which I'm a bit reluctant. I've been forced to use it, and Google, you don't like Twitter anyway at Google, do you? But that could be my excuse. Just say so you're deeply offended if I look at the iPad. But um, we're going to try and get s pick some questions up from the Twitterverse too. Um, and um, so, quite interactive. And we've decided to pose the same question as a bit of an opening gambit to all the pan members of the panel. I'll start off with you, Brad. Again, the same question to everyone. Um, in terms of this whole space with creativity, ideas, and this, this whole issue of long-term product gro productivity growth and innovation in Australia, what actually, what do you think, what actually is the problem or problems? And are they actually problems from your standpoint, that government should actually be worrying about. So, Brad, and you have to have the microphone quite high. Yeah, sure. Yep. So, I get to work with uh, small businesses every day, day in, day out, through through Hub Australia and the co-working communities that we operate um, in Sydney, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, and Adelaide. And when I look at those small businesses, really, what they're looking for is how do they get connected with the other resources that they need in order to grow uh, their businesses. Uh, when I look at Australia, we've got this huge amount of diverse knowledge capital, uh, and then we've spread it out over a really big landmass. Even in our key, in our cities of Sydney and Melbourne, um, we've still managed to spread those four and five million people over about as big an area as anybody does any, anywhere around the world. Um, so what I, what I see for small businesses is that we really need to be looking at how do we create communities of practice and communities of learning for those small businesses. I rarely have small businesses come to us saying, I, I, I need more capital. Um, what they're coming to us is, I need a connection to this, or I need a connection to that. Um, so often when I look at the myriad of different uh, learning events and, and uh, incubator events that come through uh, government channels, I often look at them and I'm like, wow, you could run a million of these events and you still won't give me all of the information that I need. What I really want is community, and through that community I develop trust with people that I work with. One thing that has not changed in the digital era is that we still do business with people that we trust. 
and how we go about building that trust, it's massively amplified um, and enhanced by the technology tools that we've got. But then how do we bring those together into those communities of learning, um, I see as that key challenge. And that's certainly where we've seen this um, huge amount uh, of growth in work hubs, in co-working spaces. Sydney actually has one of the highest amounts of co-working spaces per capita anywhere in the world. Um, and I, I don't think it's any surprise that we also see that that's where the most startups come out of uh, in Australia. Um, so when um, I look at government, I don't see that it needs to be concentrating on content delivery. I think it should be investing in how do we connect those small businesses, how do we increase our workforce participation and ensure that the awesomely diverse knowledge capital that sits in our suburban areas, a lot where, um, a lot where immigrant um, populations are, are, are first um, setting up shop when they, come, when they come here, how do we connect them into the ecosystem of business and innovation in Australia? I see that should be where government should be looking. Thanks. Same question, Jim. What is the problem? You can take my mic. Um, what is the problem in should government? What is there anything for government to do in this space? Yeah. So to me, I'd break down the nature of the problem first into why would you want to innovate in the first place, and then second, how is Australia tracking? What's the nature of of the challenge? And uh, to to me, on the one hand, you've got um, now quite an onerous task of finding a new source for income growth, given that we're unlikely to have the tailwind of very strongly rising terms of trade, which, while it's been focused on the mining sector, has actually driven income growth quite broadly across the economy. That's one issue. The second is that, as a society, there's always a set of challenges coming down the path, whether it's climate change, whether it's adjusting to ageing, demographic challenges and so forth. So there's n really never a time when you can just relax about the nature of those risks that, uh, that we as a society face. And then I think, uh, so, so that really builds a case for why innovation is going to be critical. If you want to have income growth, if you want to deal with these risks, I guess a third one would be as well that there are global public goods, that Australia as a high income economy, ought to be, or as a high income eco uh, society, ought to be making a strong contribution to. And it's in the nature of dealing with those problems that you're going to have to come up with solutions that you haven't generated before. And so those are reasons to innovate. Then I guess the flip side is, well, wh how, do we, how do we track? And I think it's, it's impossible to say um, that you know, there's an innovation crisis in Australia. There are areas where we're relatively strong, relatively weak. Um, part of the weakness is around our small and medium enterprise sector, which has got a very different character to some of the other developed economies. We're much more service focused, our SMEs are smaller and so forth, I've got a range of special constraints. But the bigger issue is just relating to that old chestnut of the tyranny of distance. Increasingly, innovation occurs geographically located. It occurs with mobile factors, whether it's talent, it's capital, whether it's multinational um, operations. And for Australia to continue to be plugged into this new um, wave of innovation that's occurring, not just around the web, in the cloud, but also in a whole range of other technology areas, thinking through what we need to do to be an attractive host for those globally mobile factors, globally mobile people, globally mo mobile operations, um, is, is, has to be front and centre because there's no guarantee given our cost base that we're the natural home for some of those activities. On the other hand, you can't expect to be the host for all of them. And so there's a really active question about where do you want to play in that space? So in terms of that second question with government, it, uh, one of the implications is that we, we've got to look at red tape, tax, all those kind of attractiveness issues. Yeah, so I suspect actually that some of those rather unglamorous um, aspects of, as you say, regulation and, and the cost base and so forth become very important. One of the drivers perhaps unheralded in the productivity growth that Australia did experience was moving to openness and moving to higher competitive pressure on our industry. So uncomfortable though that is, it appears that that was an important driver. And similarly, it's going to be uncomfortable when we're competing to host these mobile factors because in some instances, getting the best global operator in field X is going to be uncomfortable for the best Australian operator if they're not up to scratch. 
But the, the critical flip side to that, though, is that those internationally mobile factors can be strong complements to what we know how to do, and they can actually drive our incomes. So um, absolutely, those, those sort of, if you like, the conventional tools need to be part of that, but you need to think beyond it to think about the international Thanks. hosting. So the Arle, I mean, Google, major, major multinational, you get a chance to compare and contrast different economies, um, but you've located some particular stuff in Australia for a reason. So what's the sort of Google view of these issues in terms of the problem and in terms of the Australian government? Is it actually something that government needs to be very on the front foot about, or can we just let market forces, is, forces deal with it? Well, I, I wanted to um, focus initially on the, um, let's say, the adoption of new technologies um, across the economy, and particularly in the, in the small business space, because that's a, uh, a sector that makes up a very considerable chunk of the economy. Um, and if there's a, a need for new economic growth and, uh, and productivity growth, that's an area where I think there's a, a considerable um, opportunity. Um, we had a, a survey done earlier this year by Deloitte. It was published as a Connected Small Business. Um, and what they did was they, they surveyed 500 small businesses around the country and they then bracketed them according to their, uh, you know, their engagement with the web from high to low and, and very low engagement. Uh, it's very striking that the, the companies, the small businesses with high digital engagement um, were growing um, faster and, and, and doing much better. So two times more likely to be growing revenue and four times more likely uh, to be hiring people. So very considerable um, correlation there in terms of uh, business impact. But when you look at the percentages in each of those categories, you see that it's 16% uh, in the high engagement part, and uh, I think it's 59% in the uh, low or very low. So that's really the problem, I think, uh, in terms of adoption of new technologies in the small business space, particularly adoption of, of web technologies. Um, and given uh, and certainly our view from uh, business operations here that, that uh, adoption and use of these web tools does really give a shot on the arm to small businesses. Uh, the question is why, why are more of them not doing it? Uh, and the kind of things we, we hear are around this stuff is too expensive, uh, it's too timely, or it's too technical uh, in terms of how you, uh, you take it up. Um, and uh, I think us and, and many other companies in that space are trying to listen to that message and improve our offerings and make them simpler. Um, so put the sort of government perspective on that, uh, I think a certain amount of that will have to be left to market mechanisms. Companies uh, want to reach small businesses um, and it's in their business interest to do that better. Um, but government can play a role and I think uh, I'd see that in, in, in various ways. I think number one, um, uh, Brad mentioned around skills, and I think that's really important. Uh, it's important in terms of the technology sector and the high-end uh, sort of computer science skills, but we would argue that it's important across the economy because more and more in future, technology tools and platforms are going to be important for any business. So it's important that everybody coming out of the educational system has some level of familiarity and comfort uh, with, with those kind of tools. Um, a second area, I think, you know, that, that may have an impact, this may be controversial, is just around improving internet access around the country. You know, most businesses will, uh, will have reasonable access, but many don't. Uh, and of course, the National Broadband Network Project is attempting to improve that access over time. We think that will open opportunities uh, to small businesses all around the country. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> I think there's, there's a real question around uh, the web has developed a lot of these tools and platforms itself. Uh, essentially under its own dynamics with the web as an open platform. Uh, I think there are really um, strong questions there for government around regulation. Uh, and it's not that the web is unregulated today because it, it is in many different ways, uh, but the question is around let's be careful and let's be thoughtful about future regulation because that can, in the wrong circumstances, have the effect of throttling off the use of some of these tools or platforms. I just wanted to come back and I'll pass the mic to you in a minute, Brad. Um, one of the things you point about talked about, I think, whether, in effect, an economist might talk about the spillovers associated with tacit knowledge, which will tend to encourage co-location. One of the things that strikes me, being a, you know, a foreigner coming to Australia, a migrant, is the loosely federal system encourages a bit of a, um, you know, Queensland got one of those, got government funding for this, so the next, Victoria gets the next shot at it. We don't let market forces exploit the sort of co-location benefits that spillovers would generate. We dilute our assets geographically. Is that an issue in your experience? 
I guess, uh, so at the moment what we, we find from a, a, a co-working and a, a, you know, a co-inhabiting of, of spaces for small business, it's largely a CBD phenomena at this point in time. Um, I certainly see that the, the legacy of the business models that we're developing in CBD will be the ones that prop up in suburban and regional Australia and that actually attempt to connect that. I guess one side of this is yes, we could leave market forces to decide and I, I guess we've actually recently done a fair bit of work on this and um, to let, uh, for example, what we do grow organically um, you know, over the next 10 years and leave it up to market forces. Um, unfortunately, because things are so distributed, um, it's also very hard, for example, to build a work hub in a suburban area and then just simply expect that there's going to be the, the traffic to make the business model work. Um, our analysis of it is that what we really need is leadership from uh, large employers, in, including government, where we actually do enable our workforce to work in a more distributed fashion. Um, you know, so I, I guess to use the term uh, teleworking, as it's often um, often um, coined. Uh, you know, next week there's telework week here in Australia. We often talk about well, you know our workforces are able to work from wherever they like, but at the end of the day, the culture and the incentives are not such that people do go and work wherever they like. Um, so we've actually identified there that for, given the, uh, the expanse of Australia and that there is only 20 million people trying to connect this really big um, geographical area, that actually what is going to need is that it's going to need to be, a, I guess, a shot in the arm from government where it says, right, we will enable our workforce to telework once they're teleworking in suburban areas, then we do see that the market will come up with a solution which will see uh, the work hubs proliferate everywhere. Which would suit you. That's good. It, it would suit us, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, um, uh, another thing on, the mo on mobility and geography, and this is one for you, Jim, um, migration. You know, migration, people who migrate are risk takers. They tend to be more entrepreneurial. They tend to go to cities, it's true. Um, Singapore deliberately has, I think, last time I was looking at a visa class that attracts people who want to do a startup and gives them a special visa category. Um, so, coming back to the original question, Australian government federal policy, is, is our sort of stuff that impacts on migration as good as it could be? Are we exploiting opportunities? Are we ruling things out? So, just to, um, I guess, underline the, the fact base, there's a lot of evidence at the country level that new industries that flourish in a new location are often initiated by migrants who bring with them the understanding of how the industry could become a major nucleus. They bring all of the tacit knowledge that you can never get out of a book. They bring the connections and the knowledge with their supply chain both up and down and so forth. So first at the level of how quote unquote good ideas spread across countries, there's no question that so much of it is embodied in human beings, it's not, it's not codified. And that is also equally powerful when you look at the way that individual firms that are successful in a field can spawn um, whole generations of, whether they're startups in a new field like in the semiconductor field or in the automotive field back in the day, um, you see these family trees of generations of um, people spinning out from existing firms. And so in that sense, the spread of good ideas and the spread of people are in large part synonymous. Mm. Now we, we at Grattan haven't done detailed analysis of the Australian migration system. My understanding is though that there's no question that the skilled migra migration system has led to a cohort of or multiple cohorts of people with high labour force participation that have made significant contributions fiscally and I, I believe, although we haven't done the work, that, that you, would, you would also find some of the effects that I've just been talking about in Australia as well. Now, whether the, the current demand-led system and the categories that are um, codified into the way in which those, um, those visas are allocated um, is, is, is working effectively, we haven't, done, uh, we haven't done careful work. But again, from the outside, you would have thought that often those skilled labour categories 
just to, just to I, I've sort of made this point earlier, are complements, not substitutes for local labour. So there's a sense in which you're not competing for the same jobs. You're actually jointly developing something which is of higher value than you could do if you didn't have that complementary factor. And I, I haven't seen careful work that looks at how that's playing out in our context. My, my conjecture would be that we may have a big opportunity that we're not fully capturing. Just, um, just before, uh, just a, um, as a migrant, I had the experience when I was had my consulting operation. I was science, technology, policy, public policy, and went to see a migration agent about taking up permanent residency. He said, "Well, my advice is to train as a hairdresser." So there you go. Anyway. Yala. Um, so just to give a, um, our our perspective on that, and I, I agree with um, what Jim has said. Um, uh, Google in Sydney has about 400 people in an R&D centre, so, so software engineers developing um, new technologies. And Google Maps is our claim to fame, started life as a, a Sydney startup, uh, and has obviously gone on to, um, to, to great success. Um, uh, so it's interesting. I think the, the two drivers really around why that can grow from you know, literally four or five people to 400 is around uh, culture and talent. Okay. Um, uh, on the talent front, um, Australian universities produce enough good computer science uh, graduates on a regular basis that we can hire them uh, and grow the, the operation organically. Uh, but about half the people also come from overseas, and this is where the visa uh, framework becomes really important. I would say, generally speaking, that has worked pretty well, um, but uh, I put this uh, diplomatically, it's, it's, um, it's important that politics does not get into that. Um, and I think generally the Australian system is one uh, around um, uh, qualifications and talent. Uh, and if you, you know, if you meet those requirements, you can, you can get in. And I think that's a sensible way to um, structure it, and we, and we think that's the way it should um, operate. Now, on the culture front, um, uh, Sydney, uh, where, where we're based, is um, uh, a very nice place to live, and I think that's a very important factor actually for attracting people from overseas. Certainly true in my case, the weather is far superior to Irish weather um, uh, by a long way. Um, and I think uh, what, it, what attracts people to, to Sydney, and I would suggest uh, Australia has these advantages more generally, is the openness and diversity of society. That is a huge factor, a uh, huge positive in terms of attracting people from overseas and generating the kind of dynamism uh, that we think you need to develop uh, new technology solutions. Um, an area where we're perhaps not as strong here as we should be is, is the sort of culture around risk taking. And uh, risk taking is absolutely essential to innovation because if you're not taking risks, you're not going to get anything done. Um, and uh, I think it's something maybe that um, Australia perhaps isn't as strong as, as the US, for example, in terms of that embracing uh, of risk taking, the acceptance of failure uh, as a necessity of something that's important, but something that you, you have to go through in order to learn and be better uh, the next time. So maybe that's an area for some kind of um, uh, culture change over the long term, and whether government is the best um, uh, agent or actor to perhaps help affect that change, I think is, a, is an interesting question. I guess one uh, point to make there about the flip side of the coin of how do we attract migrants to come here is that also uh, our local talent now, when they look for a job, they're really looking at a global list of jobs. Um, you know, it's not just SEEK that we look at in Australia, it's SEEK that we look at um, the different versions of that all over the world. So, uh, uh, like for instance, in uh, Adelaide, um, you know, we very much establish Hub, Hub Adelaide with the state government there, with a specific focus on how do we keep uh, talent in the state. So I think that's also a, a really important thing from a policy perspective that uh, we need to bring in here. It's you know also it's the retention of talent. On the uh, on the risk taking side of things, I, I do agree with you completely. Um, I've had the opportunity to live also uh, in the US, and definitely there's that culture. I've also lived in uh, Spain, and actually that were that also had a more conservative. Um, culture than, than Australia did from a risk-taking uh, perspective. I think one of the great things for small business these days is that, um, you know, when we talk about things like uh, lean startups or minimum viable products, and you know, there are there is the opportunity to fail quickly 
and not necessarily have to fail big to work it out. Um, and I think that would be one of those core things that we really could be bringing into, um, you know, when we're talking about training of skills, how do you set up um, uh, prototypes and how do you set up uh, experiments so that you actually can fail without losing the family house? And, you know, it is possible to do that and actually throw out your prototype actually to a global audience to test it. So there are some ways that we can, we can really leverage things there. Just come in on that. Um, most of you have probably heard this story, but one of the, in the US, when you go to see a venture capitalist and you pitch concept, they'll, one of the questions is, how many times have you failed? And they like you to have failed about three times, so you can, you're really good, you're down the learning curve at identifying risks of failure and mitigating them. And I do, I must admit, I'm a bit dis dismayed to hear some academic colleagues a few years ago, you know, so-and-so left academia, it wasn't necessarily this university, and they, their business failed, ha, ha, ha. There was that kind of very churlish, ungracious attitude to something that to the Americans would just be, well, that's good, and next time around they'll probably do better. Just wanted to, unless anyone wants to come in on this, switch a bit to global value chains. Uh, one of the things that strikes us when we work with government is government tends to see these through siloized windows, trade policy, innovation policy, industry policy, um, employment, whatever. The reality of the global economy is there are transnational value chains that, they're the unit. A lot of the multinationals like Google, I might ask you what your value chain actually is in a minute, but um, it's not interesting. But um, I'll just prepare you for that one. But um, they loop through different national economies. And competitiveness is about winning and retaining a, a position in those value chains. It could be Boeing's food chain or whatever. You have to innovate and you have to pass muster to be in that, that, that game. I wonder, and I guess there's a question to the rest of the panel, to what extent does the siloized nature of particularly federal government policy, but also state government policy, looking at it through, you know, it's trade or it's something else, mean that we don't really get the interwining? I mean, a value chain is a bit like a piece of rope. All these things are woven together. And um, would we have a more effective policy stance, even if it was getting out of the way with red tape and tax, towards innovation if we had a more integrated approach? Um, Jim, do you want to take that for, or Yara, then Jim? Well, I, <clears throat> again, sort of focusing on, on the tech world and thinking about the value chain, I suppose, uh, and again, speaking about, about, about from Google's perspective, um, you know, I guess the value chain is a value chain of people, um, and therefore that makes for a very fluid um, operating model, um, because ultimately the, the products we're developing are essentially intellectual property um, type type products in in the main, um, and uh, you know, we use internally the same platform um, that we we want to use to actually deliver these things to end users, which is the the web, the global web as 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 the platform. Um, and uh, you know, it's 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 interesting talking to to policymakers um, around that kind of thing because there there is a tendency sometimes to see these web issues or they're to do with the digital economy that that particular silo uh, rather than seeing this as kind of an infrastructure that can underpin a huge amount of economic activity uh, and for example can underpin a huge amount of trade uh, in services over the longer term so I think certainly there is a a need for greater joined up thinking uh, to understand the, the 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 dynamics between different parts of the web world and how they how they link together well, Australia's got some unique, I guess, difficulties in, in, in how we participate with those value chains because um, unlike a centrally located hub like a Singapore or a Frankfurt or somewhere of this type where the flow of intermediate goods and the flow of finished goods, both very, very high and often, you know, in the case of Singapore, those are larger than GDP, um, for Australia, you, we've really got an inflow of capital goods, and then we have a more, apart from that capital good flow, we've got quite limited flows of intermediate uh, goods coming into the country just because of the trade costs being relatively high. Now, of course, the stories can be quite different in the world of services, where you can be enabled through web tools and so forth to have a much more vibrant flow of, quote unquote, you know, intermediate services um, uh, leading to, f to, f to finished products or, or vice versa. Um, and on that basis, you'd think that the opportunity for us to play a more significant role in some of those global value chains in the service world appears to be 
higher. But having said that, you can then flip back and say, well, let's look at the mobility. And increasingly now, Australia, with its absolutely world-class engineering services capability, and there's a range of others outside of, you know, if you think about the mining services, um, you know, construction services, some of the other professional services, are increasingly able to build global businesses, potentially headquartered uh, in, in Australia, but with on-the-ground presence, servicing those um, industries right across the globe is quite attractive. So I guess my fundamental point is the, the model's probably quite different sector by sector, and traditionally it's been quite difficult for us to participate, but, you, but I guess as you move towards having more factor mobility on the one hand and then the services having a far lower trade cost, the opportunities do seem to be opening up. Yeah, I mean, just on that, um, I think there's a bit of a tendency to, in government policy circles, to ignore the poten export potential of services, civil engineering, um, you know, law. There's a whole set of very vibrant finance um, activities in the service sector which are basically exporting in different ways, contributing a lot to the economy, synergizing with other parts of the economy, you know, consulting services to mining, but not just delivered to Australia, to the rest of the world. And we do tend to have a bit of a, you know, maybe it's the cultural cringe, but not recognizing that we're actually really, really good at some of this stuff, you know. We're playing a role in designing s eco cities in China and things like that, not building them, but, you know, designing them with, you know, along with um, leading firms from the rest of the world. So I, th I do sense, as someone who works quite closely with government, is that we do have a rather traditional model, and the mining boom has, re has emphasized that, of the sort of primary, secondary, tertiary structure of the economy. And we ought to kind of rebalance that. You know, we talk about evidence-based policy making. Let's actually look at some of that evidence, because it shows that the service sector is no smaller as a proportion of GDP than most other OECD nations. They're all about the same. It's about 80% or something like that. And it's vibrant, and our regional connections are very, very powerful. So but I'd like to get the audience more involved. Um, someone, we must have said something that, yeah, that you disagree with or agree with. If you could wait till the mic comes, it's going to, um, the mic is going to jog, not walk down. Um, <laughs> it's walking, but it, it's getting there. Thank you. If you could, you, you have the option to say who you are or not, because if you work in government, you don't necessarily want to say who you are. <laughs> but. Look, my name's Ian, and I'm from the Services Industry Association, so I totally endorse what you just said. Yep. But I only just want to make the point that it's a two-edged sword, that our, that our services industry is trade exposed, uh, and that, in fact, um, you know, in the move to our global internet economy, that's probably a bigger issue in a sense, um, you know, because that really doesn't mean that we have to drive innovation of high-value services to stay in the game. So we got, that raises the cultural issue. Do we have a, you know, an innovative enough culture? We, the variable that no one likes to talk about in this context, so they, the way that certain cultures seem to have a bigger appetite, appetite for risk and innovation than others. What would you say about that? I would say it's a real problem, and I, and I think um, there's, there's just not enough focus on, on that part of the, of the solution in terms of our economic uh, future. So, yeah, look, you know, whether it's a government problem or whether it needs to be shared amongst industry and others, but um, essentially we, we're not putting enough focus on that particular issue. One thing that um, I think I have perceived is that often government is called on to make up uh, for where there has been a market failure or where we're not good at something. Certainly a common sentiment for us in uh, small business is figure out what you're good at and then get really good at it. Um, so, you know, from an Australia perspective, what are those things on services and when, then when we look at agriculture, construction, mining, health, what are those things that we could get even better at? and let's figure out how we could be investing in those rather than in um, trying to improve something that we're not so good at. We're doing our best being microphone poor at the moment, switching around <laughs> like a baton in a race, but... Yep. Okay, uh, John Scott, I historically was involved in networking the whole health sector together um, and have worked across a number of different industry sectors uh, where we're working with a lot of SMEs. Uh, most SMEs have a terrible history of networking, they usually get raped and pillaged under the old B2B model. Um, in terms of government involvement, the service sector is absolutely critical, and government has big footprints in, in much of the service sector. The government and the service, the small to medium-sized enterprises need a new generation of collaboration models, which enables the SMEs, or individuals, I probably would be much better to describe it as, 
to spot their ideas and have them nurtured within a, a, a next generation type of collaboration model in order to address a number of issues. One is it's extraordinarily difficult to protect your intellectual property as a small to medium sized enterprise, even though it may be earth shattering. Second, in a lot of these cases, there are, uh, in, say in the healthcare sector, there are medical legal issues that have to be addressed. There are also whole issues about resilience of infrastructures, et cetera. And anytime you get into the electronic environment, you're actually having to line up a whole variety of sectoral players who think they either have a right to be there or a right to own it, and telcos are one of the best examples. So I think in terms of the debate about innovation and Australia's uh, future, service sectors, but it's going to take us to actively think differently about markets because in a sense we have to create markets where we define the rules of what the market looks like mm -hmm. in order for it to be a market that we would say is a market we would like to have. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'll come to a serious point in a minute, but I think it was in Tom, one of Thomas Barlow's books, um, I think it's a paraphrase of another thing, is that what's the definition of an Australian innovator? It's someone waiting to have their IP stolen. Um, but, there's, but the serious thing is government procurement and services, and I, you made some really good points there. Um, when you think about, say, the technology sector, a company like Intel um, will do what's called corporate venturing. They'll take equity stakes in a small startup in order to incubate them and bring mentor them and bring them on. And they can bring them in if they want to, or they can let them found or whatever. Um, we have a very risk averse procurement process in government. We have a very risk averse um, uh, adversarial political system that will do the blame game. But is there a role in service sector for government to play a bit more, of, you know, almost like a corporate venturing role? Because the public value from that, if you like, could be enormous, encouraging innovation. The the solution that we came up with after five years of seriously hard work had to reflect the fact that we have a public-private healthcare system and across the state boundaries. We also have an enormous range of large players from outside who think they have a right to play and, and quite genuinely do. But the issue here in terms of some of these really big sectors is government can't walk away from them. Government has to be involved in them and we get caught at times in this dilemma where, well, the, the outsiders will pay for it or no government will pay for all of it. In fact, what you have to do is focus on a collaboration mechanism which creates a virtuous cycle investment mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. where in that virtuous cycle, you're actually from government point of view often reducing the, um, uh, the angle of the cost curve as in healthcare, instead of going straight up, it's actually been tilted downward to make the system affordable. Mm -hmm. In other cases, you want third party or outside investor, both uh, private health insurance and non-health non insurance investment coming in, but they want that investment surety. And therefore your collaboration mechanism have to have government intrinsically involved in that debate because we have these tremendous tensions between wanting to capture all of the profit and sequester it off in the Cayman Islands. Now that's no bloody good for any economy uh, and certainly not for the infrastructure that supports civil mm. society. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else in the audience come in or panel on, on that one that we, I mean, I think it's an important point. I think um, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, but the, I think the challenge is around um, particularly government procurement. Um, how can government beco become more risk embracing uh, in, a, in its procurement? Because there's no surer thing than any you know, IT project that goes over budget or takes too long is going to be the subject of, of question time uh, and a lot of abuse in the media. So I think it's, it's in all our interests that somehow government figures out a way of allowing itself some space to innovate and fail, uh, and particularly in the procurement space, to perhaps take risks with smaller players uh, who may be able to develop interesting solutions um, that can open up tremendous opportunities for government, but can also give those, those small players a very prestigious and important client uh, in government. Now, I don't know how you do that, uh, but that seems to be a, a very positive dynamic. I think for companies, it's a bit different. You know, if you're spending your own dollars, you can decide to do that uh, in whatever way you, way you want. And again, at Google, we, um, we have an arm that invests in, um, uh, in um, startups, which is called Google Venture, but also an in-house, uh, as we call it, sort of sandbox called Google X, uh, which is about developing what we call kind of moonshot uh, ideas. And these are you know, very 
audacious um, ideas which may or may not work out, uh, but I suppose we, we can allow ourselves the flexibility to, to do that. So you could solve this problem, really, couldn't you, at Google? Because you could, you could incubate the government risk cur the risk curve, you could deal with that? I like the expression, stick to the knitting, you know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and don't try and bite off more than you can chew. So. Anyone else want to come in on this? Um, I've got the microphone. So Sarah? Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry, I couldn't see you, Sarah. That's right. Sarah. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Oh, I'm just saying who to say to you are. Sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Sarah Pearson. I'm uh, CEO of ANU Enterprise, which is a company that ANU owns, and we do knowledge transfer stuff. Um, really great to hear all the things you've been talking about. I wanted to quickly talk about the immigration side of things. So I think this is a fabulous opportunity. I was recently talking with the ACT government about their policies around immigration. And what they're actually finding is that the partners of the people that they're judging uh, on their immigration status are actually the entrepreneurs. Um, so you've got these partners who are desperate to do something, and so they'll be going off to your hub <laughs> to try and start up some company. I think that's an untapped uh, resource there. Um, we're talking about new collaborative models for government and the role of government in trying to stimulate innovation. We've talked about the, uh, the demand side, so the procurement, which you know, globally governments are, are trying to grapple with how they can stimulate entre entrepreneurship and innovation through procurement. But the other side is the, demand, uh, sorry, is the supply side, so there's bucket loads of data that government is sitting on. So just uh, would be curious to hear some comments around the open data and how you reckon government can be involved in that to stimulate what I think is a, is a massive opportunity for social entrepreneurship. I mean, people around the world are getting sick of waiting for government to do stuff, so they're actually getting off their backsides and developing companies themselves. But I think open data has a big part to play in that. Thanks, Sarah. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, look, agree 100% on, on the open data issue. Um, as somebody who worked in government not here but but in Ireland formerly I know that that's a, a major uh, cultural issue within government because uh, one of the first things I learned in the Irish government was you never tell anybody anything um, and you keep uh, data in 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 house um, so it's a very difficult uh, process um, and I suspect it needs to be somewhat iterative which is the people in government need to release some data and then see that that opens up positive opportunities and impacts. And I think if we can get that kind of dynamic going, uh, we'll, we'll build the momentum to open things up. Um, I believe there's a, an interesting um, uh, project going on with um, one of the state governments, I think, in PwC, where instead of releasing data that government might be reluctant to, to put out there, what they're doing is releasing it into a kind of a closed, um, let's call it innovation lab. And then what they do is they bring in a bunch of startups who PwC essentially are vouching for, um, and I think that's an opportunity, A, for the startups to get their teeth into really interesting data and potentially find a customer in government, but also as a confidence building measure uh, for people within the governmental system. But certainly all the, the research that's done in that space shows that government data is a tremendous um, resource for the economy. Um, um, you know, the public has paid for it already, so let's, let's get it out there as quickly as we can. Look, if I can just add to that, that's, it's clear that somehow between the existing government-owned data sets and what you could think of as crowd-generated or crowd-sourced data, there's a huge spectrum of some sensitive, fine, that's off, but there's a huge amount of less sensitive data which might already be public but not at scale because there's no government support for its deployment in a way that would benefit people. So if you think about the use of anonymised health data to identify correlations that could help with policy formation. That would just be one example, so I strongly support that. I think in practice governments have been exceptionally risk averse and there are recent examples of enterprises hosted in other universities which have had to fold because they just haven't found the partnership coming from government for even data that, you know, on the face of it really, really has got very low sensitivity, so. Yeah. I mean, just to be devil's advocate and a bit right wing about it, I'd prefer um, a risk-averse government than a reckless government, a really reckless government, but anyway. Um, question there in the middle. Um, <coughs> hi, uh, I'm from government, but I won't identify myself so I can be uh, as frank as uh, I like. And I didn't identify you either, you, you noticed. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, a couple of quick comments. The, um, the, the question of uh, involving SMEs and fostering or, or nurturing, mentoring even, uh, innovation it was a, a proposal put up by the previous government not long before the uh, the election, N no indication as to whether or not the 
um, the, the new government will uh, continue in that venture. There's money there and they might return that money to where it, whence it came for the greater good or else they might use it. And it's specifically to uh, uh, promote innovation in SMEs, to de-risk it, um, uh, along the, the same lines as, as models that have been used in the UK, the US, in Australia, it's uh, been used in Victoria. Um, taking a step back as to how you would encourage the government to be more risk-taking in this environment, I think it's, it's, specific, it's, it's exactly what, what's being proposed, and that's to take a portfolio approach. So you do many things, you probably keep them fairly small so that you, um, you know, do a a concept, do a proof of concept if that passes it and, and uh, slowly build it up so that the risk is, is uh, approached in bite-sized steps and you can fail early, fail cheap. Um, I think that's quite saleable to government. Uh, it's just a very hostile environment with the budget at the moment where um, there is a mantra of spend every dollar wisely and so therefore implicitly don't take risks. Um, I'd also like to talk briefly about the issue of, of data and cultural change within government. You'll be amused that just today over coffee um, I was talking with a colleague about exactly this problem and the approach that we for free have uh, landed on was yours which was to um, uh, de-risk um, uh, release data progressively into safe environments which can be data labs or, or with registered users, uh, release to academia as well as releasing to, to, um, to, to business because academia might be seen to be less prone to abuse. I don't know if that's true. I might have a view, Mark. Um, but, but also to, to focus on selling the benefits, so release a bit, make sure you get policy and other benefits from that data, build on it, and not go immediately because the, the colleague with whom I was discussing this uh, was could see the benefits of the whole of economy linkage of many administrative data sets and say, oh, wouldn't this be wonderful? Uh, and that just is perhaps too much in one step. So de-risk small steps for this as well. Um, the um, One of the other issues that came up though in the, uh, as an uh, implicit hurdle against the budget is that quite often um, this is an area within government where there's been historic underinvestment in both people and infrastructure, as in looking after the data, husbanding the data, properly defining the metadata that will allow you to use it. When you get into this area and say, we now want you to release your data to a bunch of third parties so they can do stuff, there may be some reluctance to reveal the secrets of government. Very often it's much more prosaic. It's about oh, well, um, we'd then have to clean the data. We'd have to put it on a better platform. It's, it's on some sort of old-fashioned, underinvested software, and, w and we don't have the people or the, or the very small amounts of investment to, to allow it to run free. And again, in this constraint environment, budget constraint environment, where um, capital, IT capital budgets are being directly, explicitly cut by the government, it's much harder to get even that small amount of seed capital to, or seed resources, can be people, uh, to, to make what might be uh, your first steps, your first pilots. Yeah. So difficult times. Yeah. Thanks, Amit. It just strikes me that um, you know, a company like Google with your X, X lab, I mean, th there might be some uh, infrastructure technologies that could you know, really shortcut and speed up that process of getting data release ready. Um, you know, like you've done with the maps, and so, I mean, that's, in that's integrating satellite imagery very effectively and making it really widely accessible. That might be an area, a sort of public good thing that something like Google could help with a lot. Um, I think that gentleman is, is absolutely right, though, that, that, that often the data is in, um, you know, the wrong format, and there's quite a lot of work to be done to get it into even a, a sort of a basic format where it could be released and, and, and used. Um, so that that process has to be gone through. Uh, and of course, if, if the cost of doing that is falling on a government agency and they're saying, hang on, we're just making this available, um, you know, is there going to be a benefit? Uh, how are we going to cover these costs? It's a very real um, issue and, and, and one that's um, uh, difficult to, to overcome. Uh, I suppose those of us who, who support opening up government data have to do a better job of, of highlighting the upsides. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of the, the approach being around baby steps, building confidence, and showing that, in fact, this is, uh, this is an area that can open up tremendous opportunities economically and socially. Oh, yeah. Right, and then... then yeah.
was just going to say, I, I, data is not really one of those things that I think about too much. Um, but it, it does strike me listening to the comments there that uh, through the different co-working communities that have now propped up, there's actually an ability from a distribution perspective to access a, a much larger number of small businesses at a single location. I mean, like for instance, just at our hub network, we've got 900 businesses over only about 2,000 metres squared of space. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're very concentrated. So uh, I, I think that could be a great distribution method to actually get that data in front of the small businesses that you want and also know that they'll still be back the next day. I have this kind of chicken farm view of your <laughs> thing. Just like a que question at the front there. Hi, my name is Daniel. I work in corporate tax at Treasury. Just on the data sharing thing and about the cost of it, a lot of the upfront costs of it can be seen as an investment. In Sweden, their constitution requires them to release a lot of their data. And so, so with their tax policy, they have all the finest uh, tax policy academics delving into their tax data because it's the only country where they can get it. And so they've got all these free people working for them, telling them how they can improve their tax policy. And so they can either have more effective tax policy or even sort of like cut some costs and not have to be investing themselves into trying to understand what's going on and how to improve the policy. And I remember when I was doing some policy consulting when Blair, a few years after Blair came in, I remember talking to the Treasury about, you know, and I asked for some data and I never assumed, you know, and they posted me a, a CD with a massive amount of data that was just like, well, there you go, you know, we, we, we're happy to share this. And I was completely taken aback, so it's, yeah, but the Sweden stuff is very important. Anyone else want to come in for the audience on this? Um, so, there and then back at the front, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, issue about the, uh, uh, Matt said about innovation policy. Uh, I worked before in, uh, with the government as well, related to innovation policy as well, and then I moved to uh, starting up my own businesses as well, and failed a couple of times. and. Uh, and I think the, the one that that uh, very important on that time was actually about entrepreneurship, really taking risks. And but there was uh, missing there in terms of uh, really a policy backup from the government, for instance, about uh, when dealing with bank, for instance, borrowing money, things like that. So uh, in, in Australia, I think uh, when you're talking about innovation, you're talking about how much uh, I mean innovation policy from the government. You're expecting that the government will put. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, put up actually policies related to R&D, R&D policy, the talking about the implementing CRCs, for instance, helping uh, government research centers and, and, and businesses actually working together, and hope by hoping uh, creating entrepreneurship there. Uh, and I think, I, I, I compared to uh, what I saw actually in Europe, in many universities there, uh, I think in Australia we are lacking about entrepreneurship uh, in, at the university level. That's actually, I know this actually comparing to some uh, uh, many universities in, in, in Europe. So you think that actually to build the culture of innovation, you should start it with the universities. That's the question. And, 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 and for instance, I knew we are very strong with, uh, with research here. But honestly, uh, I haven't seen significant, I mean, businesses really created ma compared to Europe. I mean, coming from ANU, for instance. I think this should be a challenge. And do you think that innovation policy as I call it, actually a culture rather than a policy, should be actually started from, uh, I mean, really prop up and put more money for CRCs, for instance, putting a lot of money in, uh, with, uh, into the universities re related to the research implemented into the business, for instance, like that? Yeah. I might take that one, and uh, probably colleagues, I'm looking at Sarah might want to, if she can grab the mic. But um, look, my view um, is that government has thrown squillions at types of research that are orientated towards commercialization and entities like you mentioned the cooperative research center program um, we and this is one of the big policy issues we have thrown a lot of money at this stuff for a long time i think the crc program started in what 1992 ish something like that um, now i'm not going to say whether it was limited success or not i'll let people draw their own conclusions but we've you know we have this perceived innovation deficit I think this is where we have issues of culture that we talked about, um, incentives, um, the way capital gains tax works and things like that. Um, but we shouldn't be throwing more money at commercialization. Um, we should be 
perhaps doing more to facilitate the people who want to do that kind of stuff um, and rewarding that. I mean, there are things like if you want to leave academia for three years, um, um, you know, you're making it easy so you don't lose your, pen your superannuation stuff and all that kind of thing. People complain about that. I, don't, I mean, I personally think you should just take the risk. I mean, American wouldn't worry about that kind of, it's a bit of an Australian obsession, superannuation. So it reflects our culture. We encourage people to retire at 55, which is mad. Um, and, and people really do retire in, in there. So I wouldn't throw more money. I mean, that's one thing. I think government should just get out of the way there. I think they've thrown enough money. We spend a lot on research. We always whinge we don't spend on research. We actually spend quite a lot. Um, and I think we have to look at our culture and our other the aspects of our sort of policy infrastructure that get in the way. Um, we've got to wrap up in the next few minutes, so I think we've got another one, and I think there's Zoe too, uh, is that, yeah? yeah? So just, we'll take two more, yeah. I'll just be quick. Um, yeah. So I just, thinking about what Erla said earlier, and um, you know, the, the whole issue of uh, digital literacy and, and take up, you know, we talked about the skills issue in the sense of expert skills for science, technology, engineering and maths and so on. But we, you know, Google's done some reports globally and it looks like Australian in, uh, industry is, you know, prox approximately only half as good as the UK industry in terms of digital take up and, ado and adoption. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about innovation priorities. As, as Erla was saying earlier, those organisations that do um, adopt technologies tend to be much more successful as a result. So I think there is a key priority area there around accelerating digital literacy, and um, particularly in small medium enterprises. Thanks. Uh, Zoe Piper from ACCI. I just wanted to make a quick comment on the data. I've actually got a lot of different people from a lot of different organisations wanting to give me data, including a number of different government departments, industry associations, professional bodies, academics and so on. And I also have private companies wanting to work with me to help <coughs> to help analyse the data, including IBM. I've also been speaking a little bit with Google. So certainly open to any ideas or any input that people might want to have into that. The idea is to use that data to draw out insights on productivity, firm level productivity in Australia, um, as part of the productivity leadership program that ACCI is running. Any, uh, back to you, Sarah, Can we, have you got a mic? Or? Oh, you have, oh God, <laughs> the system's working. <laughs> So I just want to make a quick comment and say yes, absolutely agree with everything that you've, uh, you've been saying about the response. I think um, there's been studies that shown that a lot more money has been thrown at university-based R&D, but it hasn't then led to perhaps the ROI and the growth of industry, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe we could be more strategic. When I know that's a, um, a bit of a, an issue for, for government, they, don't, they say we don't like to pick winners, but do we need to be more strategic? So that's a question to throw in. I think uh, I'm certainly seeing that industry is, is very keen to collaborate with universities. They see that there's this fantastic expertise, and they've paid for it. <laughs> so they'd love to be able to use it. So I think um, universities need to make it easy. I think that's one reason why industry doesn't go to universities. They're pretty difficult to collaborate with. And part of that is that culture. You talked about that, the reward systems, etc. But it's not just the culture inside I uh, the university sector. It's the culture inside some of the corporates as well. You know, that, that culture needs, needs to be addressed. I think culture is one of the biggest challenges that we've talked about tonight, which needs, needs addressing. Who does that? I don't know, but let's get on with it. Um, I think in the past, government has seen, they think innovation is R&D. And my God, it's not. You know, innovation is so much bigger than the university system or, or the, the R&D. So I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for governments to expand out and, um, and see innovation for what it really is and invest where it needs to invest. And I have to say, this is being filmed, but I'm going to say it anyway, using innovation as an excuse for corporate welfare is not a good idea to um, that, that kind of game. Um, Anyone want to come back on some of the issues that Sarah was talking about, culture? Jim, you've been a bit quiet for a bit. Let's get you going. Well, I just come back to the observation that very little of the technical um, innovation of the world is done de novo in Australia. So it's really all about getting embedded into that global process and making the most out of, call it adaptation or adoption, call it participating in the, in the global value chain, um, the, the point is to be very outward, outward looking and very open and that means not being protective about your own uh, patch but recognising that the, the pie that's out there is so big and it's about grabbing, grabbing hold of it. I'm sorry, Mark, but I'm just going to jump in there because absolutely, absolutely, that's absolutely. Right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> uh, 
And um, I have come from an open innovation background. I'm really trying to get Australia open for business because there's so many large multinationals in the Northern Hemisphere who are really keen to access the SMEs in Australia. Let's get, get that open. But then there's the other, other issue, which is, is Australia the developer of ideas or are they the commercialiser of ideas? We only, have, we only generate 2% of, of the um, research of the world in Australia. So perhaps we should just get much better at commercialising research from around the world. Just, to, just yeah. an idea to throw in there. And there's also, in, we tend to assume both in universities and policy that there's a problem with big major multinationals like pharmaceutical companies knowing about the, the knowledge and IP we have in universities. I saw a presentation in Europe called the, in, the IP Extraction Strategy. And it was how, you, you, know, you know the researchers, you want to get their stuff, you know. And, and it was a seven level strategy of how to vacuum cleaner that intellectual property out of that university. Things like do a consultancy company with the leading professor, don't let it go through the research office, and make sure the small print gives you access to all the IP in the department. Once you've signed it, you're done. And that kind of, and if they, if they turn you down, sponsor three postgraduates. Graduates. It was like, you know, it was very structured. So they're out there, they read the stuff, they, they do that stuff. Um, there's not a problem. We assume that we need databases to let people know about the IP. The big multinationals know all about it. I mean, that's not the issue. Anyway, there's a, just a final thing, somewhere, uh, someone caught my eye back. Ah, oh, we're there, okay. I'll let you have the final question and then oh, there's some nibbles okay. and things afterwards. Um, one thing I noticed is that the discussion has been quite abstract and um, I was wondering what kind of innovations are we talking about? Probably don't have time to sort of uh, address that. And perhaps that's part of the problem that um, the way we talk about these things maybe isn't cutting through to a lot of people in government, in the community to get the momentum behind. Um, innovation and the benefits of innovation. And um, the other thing I would sort of s mention in a tongue-in-cheek way is probably if you're approaching government with any proposals, um, just scrub the word innovation from your proposal because um, it's sort of not the acceptable word anymore. So just get your thesaurus out and uh, look for <laughs> um, synonyms. Oh, very good points, um, and certainly the latter point is uh, certainly true. In terms of the abstract, I think we came, we were talking about the data thing. I think we could have given better examples. One is e-health, I think you alluded to it, Jim. If we've got all this ill health, e-health data, ill health, it is ill health data, but e ill health data, if you anonymized it, people could do et epidemiological studies and you could actually contract as a, you know, I could contract to have other people look at the data that my doctors see and maybe it's a bit like a sort of pattern recognition second opinion. You could have a whole value-added market. I remember when I raised that with the Department of Health a few years ago, and they said they'd get back to me and never did. Um, so there's that kind of issue. But you know, there, there are concrete things that you could do with data that I think that are tangible. And we, we, you're right, we should have. But I'm just going to quickly, as we, uh, there are, it says on my thing, soft drink and nibbles. I'm just warning you, it's soft drinks and nibbles. Um, but it's not hard liquor. But um, just starting, um, starting maybe with you, Brad, just to, any quick summing up points, something uh, outstanding agenda items you want to just stress before we wrap up? Doesn't matter if there's nothing. <laughs> I, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity there where we look for ways that we can better foster collaboration between the SMEs. We touched on a little bit of these points there, but you know, we're, we're now seeing um, small businesses at the hub from about five different industry disciplines all getting themselves together and starting to going on pitches together. So it's not even that they're an incorporated entity. Um, there are now some ways at our disposal of really supercharging the collaborative tent potential of small business. And I think that that would be a, a really big thing to focus on. Uh, and the only other point that I really want to highlight as well is the, the, the knowledge capital that sits in the diversity of people that are living and working in suburban Australia. It's how do we capture that? Um, because it's all sitting there. You used the phrase industry disciplines, working in a university, that made me shudder. I mean, people talk about loyalty to the discipline is the most important thing. And there's, there's industry disciplines now, that's a nightmare. Anyway, Jim. Uh, to me, the, the challenge that was just put forward around, you know, what are the concrete innovations that we're talking about here is such an interesting one. And what I perceive is just across industry sectors, there is so much of interest going on globally, you can pick any sector, and it's the result of the IT revolution, the materials revolution, uh, the, the comms revolution, all of those things are impacting multiple industries in such diverse ways, and so it's just very, it's really impossible for 
a central planner to pick priorities and it's much more about saying what do we need to do to maximise our exposure to what's going on. So again, I come back to the openness as opposed to the trying to, trying to get the most out of your narrow field and just be, being, having some confidence that Australian capability when mixed with that global richness is, is going to lead to a plus for us. Last word to Google. So. Oh, better make it a good one. Um, no, I, I, I think you're right around the, the jargon and certainly in the tech sector, we love our jargon. Um, and uh, we, we talk about things like cloud computing, you know, what, whatever that is. Um, uh, and indeed that, um, that gets into, um, uh, gets us into great difficulties when we're trying to talk to small businesses and the people who run them because they just don't understand what things like cloud computing are. Um, but I think if we can put it in simple terms, it's like, you know, maybe it's using Twitter or Facebook or YouTube to talk to your customers. Which, by the way, it didn't work tonight, so. You know. Well, that's okay. I'm very sad to hear that. You, you sabotaged it. <laughs> Um, or, or, or maps or online advertising platforms, you're absolutely right. We need to, to make these things more concrete and, and, and simpler um, and, and, and so people will be prepared at least to, to consider them. So, Okay, look, I'd, um, if you could all thank my colleagues here for... Um, <laughs>